Hi everyone, this is Sonali. Thank you all for carving out some time for attending today's webinar on COVID-19 impact and opportunity for innovation in the education industry. Just to give you a brief, we'll have two separate speaker sessions today, each about 45 minutes in duration. This would also include the live Q&A round. To all the attendees out there, please type in any questions you might have in the Q&A section and we'll try to answer as many as possible at the end of each session. Request you to keep the questions within the scope of today's discussion and not to your personal business queries. I would now like to introduce our first speaker. We have with us Dr. Akhil Shahani, who's the managing director of the Shahani Group, which runs a range of colleges in areas like business, media, real estate, finance, and others. He's also a venture partner in Kaizen Private Equity, which is India's first private equity fund focused solely on the education sector. In addition, Akhil serves as the chairman of Global Discovery Schools, which are a franchised chain of 14 innovative schools. He is the director of the Sage Foundation and trustee of the Shahani Trust, which both have a range of charitable initiatives in education. Akhil also sits on the board of 28 iconic colleges in Mumbai. Akhil is the recipient of many awards for his work in education, and he's a regular speaker at conferences and has been extensively profiled in the media. With this, I hand it over to Dr. Akhil. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you, Sunali. I hope my 45 minutes doesn't include the very long, generous uh, introduction that you gave me. So we have extra time. All right, I'm just going to start sharing my screen and hopefully you all can see it. Uh, just to confirm that you can. All right, is that visible? Uh, yes, it's visible. Okay, great. Let me just bring it up to the main thing. All right, welcome everyone and uh, welcome to the new normal, uh, as we call it, uh, here in the education sector. Hang on, let me just try to get this. All right. Well, I think this is a very familiar screen that most of us have been used to uh, facing it probably sometimes once, twice, thrice a day. And uh, I think what's interesting about this is that probably I'm assuming that uh, two months ago, a vast majority of us never used Zoom. I mean, like we used to go for physical meetings and we used to go for physical conferences, do networking, give our business cards. And we were never really looking at coming for webinars. There were a lot of webinars I was invited to last year, but you know, as a, a panelist, but I never used to attend. I mean, I thought like, let me meet people face to face, but suddenly because we're forced to be at home, we've changed our behavior. Now, when you talk about the new normal, we have to ask ourselves a question is that does this behavior change permanently or is it temporary? Let me take a step back and let's talk a bit about the uh, September 11 attacks, which happened in uh, the US and that focus on the war on terror in the early 2000s. It was another major world changing event because even after uh, Osama bin Laden was killed, Al Qaeda sort of uh, was uh, not as prominent as it was, people's attitude to security changed. We are now used to the new normal of going to airports three hours in advance, standing in long uh, security lines. We have to show uh, not uh, take any liquids in our handbags. Everything, go to hotels, you're scanned, go to buildings, you're scanned. You are used to the new normal because the thing is, is that one major event has changed you even after the event is over, your attitude and your uh, focus has changed. Our attitude and focus has changed on security. Today, our attitude and focus is now focused on personal health and social distancing and the concern that we may be infected uh, if we go to a public place. Now, even after the COVID pandemic uh, dies away, you're gonna see these changes happening. But let me just talk a bit about what's happening right now. Even though a lot of us are talking about schools and colleges and all basically having online uh, teaching, the thing is, the, the problem is that almost 43% of people who have their kids or our students themselves say they don't have the right equipment to uh, deal with online education. The thing is that they may have a, a phone. And I know this because our own colleges and schools, we've gone on to uh, teaching our uh, courses online. But the problem again is that uh, it may sound great from our side that we have all the networks and we have all our teachers changing their mindset to teaching online. But we have a large, large majority of students who don't have good quality phones or they have bad quality internet connectivity. And it's, there's a lot of disturbance which uh, makes their life difficult. So moving to this new pure online uh, model is also uh, taking uh, time in terms of there's a digital divide in people who have 
the technology and people who don't have the technology. But let's talk about some of the other aspects what's happening. Like, let's talk about, uh, some of you may have read the news that uh, international colleges, a lot of students are suing these global colleges and saying that, look, we want our fees back or part of our fees refunded because if you go to, let's say, Harvard and pay $55,000, and uh, if Harvard's saying, okay, you pay $55,000, but you're not going to have classes, you're not going to have the interactivity, you're not going to meet your other students, you won't have the parties, you won't have the sports. Then students are asking the question is, why should we pay $55,000 for that year? You're still teaching me, but I want to refund a part of my fees. A lot of students in India are asking the question is that if there's no physical experience in college, why should we go abroad and take part in that college? Because a key component of college internationally is that experience of dealing with people from other countries, a new environment, there's a certain immersive experience that you will not get uh, through a Zoom lecture. So that's what's happening in international colleges. Let's talk even a bit about globally, what are educational organizations uh, facing? So you look at the left side, you say that the short term impact, a large number of educational organizations are seeing, you see all the reds on the left hand side, you see that most of them feel that they will be worse or substantially worse in the short term. In the long term, majority will still be slightly worse or slightly better, but even then they're not as optimistic as uh, we'd like to feel. So there is a crisis, there's no question about it. However, this is a Chinese character for crisis. It's, a, it's called Weiji, and the Chinese word for crisis has two components. The component for danger and the component for opportunity. So when we look at the crisis that we call the COVID uh, lockdown, the COVID pandemic, there's also an opportunity. So let's talk a bit about that opportunity. What is actually going to be the new normal? Because as I said, when you looked at the 9-11 attacks in America, there was a huge opportunity for companies who are in the security business, in the people safety business, who actually saw a huge jump in their uh, business. They had like their more security cameras, more uh, 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 scanning devices, things like that which were never needed before 2001. What is the opportunity with the new normal, with the change behavior that we're gonna see post pandemic? Okay, this is a Chinese classroom uh, with the school that just recently opened. And as you can see is that it's not crowded with students, there's social distancing. That means that even after the pandemic is over, people, and uh, forget about the fact that the vaccine may or may not happen in uh, one year, 18 months, uh, 24 months. The point is that a certain fear that people have, especially parents with their kids, is that I don't want my kid to come into a classroom where there are 50 other kids crowded together because I'm concerned about them uh, being sort of uh, infected. So every school and college will be forced to say that if I've got a classroom capacity of 60 students, I can't fit in probably not more than 15 or 20 students with at least uh, six feet different uh, distance between each of them so that there's no uh, this thing, uh, so there's no close contact and there's social distancing. But you need to understand one thing is that you have the college or the school has limited infrastructure. That means that where they could probably hold around maybe 500 students in one building, they now had to fit in 50 students. That means obviously the other 450 students can't disappear. They will have to start doing things like along with social distancing, start staggering the classes. Maybe you'll have things like uh, this thing, you'll have staggered uh, classroom, where like some classes will be taken early in the morning, some will be taken in the afternoon. You may have some uh, classes being taken on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and some be taken on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. You will, the problem is that you still have the school term, which is the same length, but you have to find ways to teach all the students in with less time spent in class, all right? Now that's gonna change schools a lot, all right? To a great extent. And that can be the same in colleges. Now that means that a lot of schools, and this is quite interesting, is that education for the longest time has been the least disruptable industry. You talk about, let's say, I'm talking about, let's say, uh, in 2018, 2019, uh, there was the media industry, the food industry, finance industry, all were disrupted by FinTech, food tech, delivery tech, all stuff. Education was happy using the same systems that they were using for the last 200 years. I mean, the classic model was, Students all come in class, they sit listening to a lecturer and uh, they finish that class and they go to the next lecture and the third lecture and the fourth lecture. It was basically the whole process. At the end you had, you studied and you had your exams and that's it. It didn't change for the last uh, 200 years. 
or the only technology that was added in those days was maybe they have like a whiteboard instead of a blackboard, or now they had PowerPoint instead of, uh, let's say, whiteboards. But the thing is that the lecture basically was the student sits down and listens to information being given by the lecturer. Now what has happened, because you cannot, uh, schools and colleges do not have the, uh, how should I say, the luxury of having 50 people in the class, they now have to start looking at new methods of education. And this is something, for example, the flipped classroom. The flipped classroom model is something that uh, requires students to be at home, study in advance for the classroom. That means, for example, like let's say they have to learn Newton's second law of motion. They will maybe look at an animation on Newton's second law of motion. There may be a, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a broader lecture or something that they see on their mobile phone or their laptop. They prepare the content in advance. Then one, with the understanding of the content, they come to class and then they'll have a project on Newton's second law of motion. They may discuss it in smaller groups of, let's say, five, 10 people where they are sep uh, sitting separately from each other, but there are less people in the classroom and they're managing that. What happens is that instead of having a day long, let's say six hour set of lectures in a class, you will have students study the content on, uh, online or on before the classroom. They come in for the short interactive session, which may not last more than half an hour, one hour. That means that the same amount of content can be done within two, three hours across the whole day. That means the amount of time a student spends in class is much less than what they learn outside. And they can do projects, they can ask questions to their professors, Online, they can uh, ask questions on WhatsApp. A lot of the interactivity that they would have in class, they're having outside of class. So the clip, I believe that the flipped classroom model is going to get more and more prevalent even after the colleges and schools open and we roll out education. And I believe that this is going to be the new normal for schools and colleges. Now, that means that even when you look at uh, synchronous or asynchronous learning, you need to ask yourself, what are the two methods of learning? Now, each of these have opportunities for education technology companies. Let's talk about this. Synchronous learning means that uh, students will all come together at the same time for online class, like a classic live Zoom class. The teacher is there. The teacher will, let's say, uh, give the lecture or give the talk. The students are there listening and they're asking questions live. There may be live chats, there may be uh, instant messaging going on. But once the lecture is over, the lecture is over. They all come at the same time and they all end the lecture at the same time. That is synchronous. They all learn synchronously. Asynchronously, it means that basically the student will read the content beforehand. Maybe they will access a pre-recorded video on a YouTube or the learning management system of the college. Uh, they may actually see a pre-recorded, uh, let's say, some sort of animation or something provided by a tech company. They may uh, have a discussion forum where they're posting messages on a group and answering and asking questions. The faculty is giving them assignments to complete where they're uploading their answers on the learning management system and they're sort of reading articles. That is at their own time. I mean, some students can do it at 12 o'clock at night, one student can do it at seven o'clock in the morning, but the point is asynchronous. They're not there at the same time. That means for edtech companies, synchronous learning means people who are providing learning platforms that provide video or like uh, live uh, uh, classes have a chance of actually getting access to the synchronous learning where students, students are looking for synchronous learning. There's an opportunity for edtech companies there. Asynchronous learning is more like when you are, let's say, a provider of education content, curriculum content, things like, let's say, pre-recorded videos. Why do you need to get the video of, let's say, Professor Sharma in your school when you can actually get, uh, let's say, uh, uh, one of the top professors of MIT teaching the second uh, Newton second law of motion on a pre-recorded video? You don't have to limit yourself to your own uh, professors in your college. That means that you can get access to content from anywhere. And again, edtech companies that can provide that content in a structured format would also have a chance to uh, interact. But that is just an example of what would happen with synchronous and asynchronous learning and what the opportunities are. But let's talk about, let's say, what's happening currently. The thing is that, as you can see, you already know this, is that uh, Zoom is being downloaded. I think there are roughly 62 million downloads of Zoom in the last week that the numbers have come out. You have uh, many more students signing up for online classes, uh, people are uh, signing for online courses like uh, skilling and upgrad, where they learn new programming languages, they learn new things, new skills to upgrade themselves. The point is people are getting more and more used to learning content online. But, agreed. So now we know that's the new normal. The new normal is basically people will be using pure online learning or blended learning, flipped classroom, where there's some online, some offline. But the point is that for all edtech companies in this space, what is the opportunity? 
Now, this is the EdTech market, market map that you can see, which talks about education technology companies globally, what the opportunity, what, how they're divided into different sections. Now, obviously, all EdTech is not the same. Same way like in finance, someone who's a bank and let's say an NBFC are slightly different. So let's look at the EdTech market map and let's talk about the actual opportunities for EdTech companies in each space. Now, if you are in an EdTech company or looking at education technology, figure out where you fit into this map and what the opportunity is, right? So let's start from the left-hand side, the learning management systems. These are basically the complete platforms that schools and college will incorporate into their own uh, system. And they be uh, uh, one all-in-one platforms. That means that they can have discussion forums, they can have uh, places to upload their assignments, you can do exams on them, you can have live videos, uh, synchronous learning, you can have uh, asynchronous videos happening. So these are when you are a very advanced uh, institution, you incorporate a complete learning management system. All of it is done at the same time. The, uh, the most uh, popular ones being, uh, let's say, Moodle and uh, Blackboard. Now, learning management systems at the moment are a little more advanced. So schools who are currently, and colleges that are currently adapting to Zoom and free options like Google Classroom, they're already happy dealing with those two things. It'll take a bit of time for them to start incorporating learning management systems uh, into their uh, pedagogy. So the learning management system companies may get a benefit, but over a slightly longer period of time, not immediately. Uh, moving next to early childhood education, these are a little bit, these are again, these little uh, content provider that help uh, preschools and uh, younger kids to actually learn uh, concepts. Again, uh, there may be a little bump uh, to them, but the thing is, is that uh, preschools tend to be more experiential. So it will take a bit of time for the early childhood education guys to uh, get a lot more content uh, provided to these uh, parents and their kids. There will be, will be a bump uh, for them as well. There'll be an uh, upscale for them, but not as much. Uh, the broad online learning platforms like, let's say, Educard, Udemy, which are provide, Coursera, which are providing online courses, they, I think, will get a decent uh, rise in uh, business because what will happen is that as people are getting used to learning online by default, they, uh, they've changed their behavior. Therefore, by default, they're going to start learning more and more content on uh, these online platforms. And they start getting used to taking courses. What used to be a, a smaller, minor activity is now becoming more mainstream. People will be used to learning online. However, let's not forget is that once people get back to their office and back to their day-to-day -day work, the amount of free time they have available to learn online may actually come down. So there will be people getting used to learning online on these platforms, but the focus of just learning because you're bored may come down a lot. So you may have a bump uh, soon after the pandemic is over, but it may go down to normal, but uh, slightly more. Uh, enterprise learning, which is the next uh, 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 group of uh, companies in EdTech, would again be uh, companies that provide online learning for companies in a B2B model. That means they'll go to a company and say, okay, we will train your, uh, here's an information platform that we can use to train your salespeople all in one company. Company will buy the lessons from them. Uh, I don't see a lot of that changing because companies are already doing that and they're providing this online education for their people. I think a lot of companies are happy to say, we will just give them as much learning as they need to upgrade their skills, but not more because we need them to spend time actually working in the company, not just, uh, they can learn on their own time, but not necessarily uh, extra time being given. Uh, next generation schools, uh, schools which are already incorporating uh, some of the flip classroom models I was talking about earlier, they may not get a big bump in uh, uh, student uh, admissions, but I, I think they will benefit at least their models become more mainstream. In fact, there will be more schools offering flip classrooms, so therefore it's likely that these schools will face some competition because other schools are doing uh, similar things. Uh, tech learning on the extreme right, uh, we have Udacity and uh, uh, Code Combat and all, which is where we're learning, we're teaching uh, students to actually uh, build up skills in programming and technology. I think that in any case uh, has been an up uptrend uh, swing because what happens is that any case, as a lot of work gets automated, a lot more technology is needed to be created, There's a lot more apps being developed, a lot more uh, business software being developed, and they all need coders for that. So therefore, there is a demand for good quality coders who understand Ruby on Rails, uh, programs like Python and things like that, uh, data analytics. So there will be an upscale in tech learning, not necessarily just because of code, but generally because the future work will be more tech enabled and they'll require more programmers and uh, tech enabled uh, people. Uh, below the bottom, the uh, test prep guys, the guys who do uh, tuition uh, uh, content, I think they're getting a big bump already. Uh, Baiju and Topper are doing very well. They're getting a lot of funding, a lot of Chinese companies are getting the same thing. 
So I think there's a good, uh, a gr a good, good uh, position for them, I think we already know. Uh, next to that is search, uh, that is uh, identifying good colleges and schools to send your kid to. Uh, I don't see a much change happening there because in any case, people are using these platforms to identify uh, good colleges and schools. Like for example, like let's say a shiksha.com or other platforms like that. It won't get a huge jump in uh, uh, traffic. Uh, school administration software again would be like learning management systems. Uh, I think schools are already uh, trying to deal with trying to uh, move themselves to uh, providing online flip classroom education. So they're already going to have to deal with getting LMS systems in place. So school admission software will be there, but may not be as widespread. They won't get a huge uh, jump uh, because of COVID uh, panic. Uh, language learning, uh, any case, is uh, growing. In fact, China is a massive market for language learning, which I'm going to talk about uh, later. But uh, there's not going to be a huge jump. There will be people who want to learn English. Uh, that's that's going to be already there. Uh, let's talk about next gen study tools. Those are just basically tools that help students study. Not that uh, additionally useful. I mean, it's going to not be that useful. And again, you have uh, the other online to offline education. Again, those are uh, let's say varsity tutors would be example of uh, online tutors in other countries, a bit like Tutor Vista, where they're teaching uh, American students uh, how to study. Again, not a big jump, but uh, they'll get some benefit. So the thing is that overall, the ben there are more or less benefits for the edtech industry. And I think uh, when you look at this next slide, this actually maps out the education technology industry in India. Again, that's less uh, complex than uh, what's there internationally because there are not as many strong LMSs or uh, school administrative software that's really done well. But even then, the K-12 education, the test prep guys are going to do well. Uh, the online learning guys are doing well. Apps and games to, for kids will do okay because that's already being uh, used. Language learning already has that uh, uh, tailwind that helps it grow because people want to learn more and more English to get into white collar uh, jobs. Uh, education finance, I think, uh, Incred and all those guys who provide student loans may have to start changing some of their models a bit because uh, right now, I don't know if they provide uh, loans for online education. They may have to start looking at that and uh, you know, there, there will be some changes in the models to some extent. Networking portals, again, not, uh, not a major change. That's really more information stuff that people are looking at. Tech learning, again, is uh, coding, which I said already, because there's a big demand over the longer term for the future of work, people are going to require uh, coding skills. So that's uh, going to keep on increasing. However, let's talk about something. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but the largest education ed tech market in the world is China, not US. Now you need to understand this. If you are in the education or education technology space in India, stop looking at US models. Start looking at China. And I'll tell you why. Because China and India have a lot of uh, few commonalities that make uh, India more likely to be like the Chinese model than the US model. Let's talk about the Chinese model. The China's model operates huge population with a growing middle class, which India also has. The second thing is, is that China has a huge amount of respect for higher education, which India has. So for example, uh, in India, if you drop a textbook on the floor, you will pick it up and you will uh, ask for forgiveness. No other country in the world except China do people ask for forgiveness if they are seen insulting education. So India and China have a huge amount of respect for education. The third thing is that China has a few selective colleges and they have these very, very stringent exams for thousands of kids to get into very few number of college seats. There's a Gaokao uh, examination, which is in China, which uh, hundreds of thousands of Chinese students take to get into the college of their choice. Same thing like in India, we have a, a few colleges which are high in demand, like the IIMs and the IITs and all, which thousands of kids sort of give up two, three years of their lives to make sure that they get into these uh, uh, colleges, which is why the test prep industry in India is doing well, very similar to China. So what you should really look at is that if you want to figure out what is the best strategy to follow, and I know that that information is not as easy available as the information that you get on America and the UK, but start looking at information about the Chinese education market. Uh, there's a great site called Hold on IQ, which is uh, uh, the guys who came up with this chart, which is uh, quite uh, useful in knowing about the Chinese education market or the Asian education market in general. Uh, in fact, this is just a little more illustrative. If you look at the top 10 invest, uh, ed tech unicorns uh, in the world, the top five are Chinese. There's only one Baiju is an Indian. Uh, there are six Chinese, three American, one Indian. So that shows the amount of ability that these uh, Chinese companies have. And again, the companies like 
VIP kid and iTutor group, again, are doing similar to things like India. They're doing English language training. They're doing vocational training. They're doing uh, test prep to some extent. So a lot of commonalities in India and uh, China. So uh, these are, this is actually the latest information. So these are the venture capital funds who are very, very interested in education technology companies. In fact, as you may be seeing the buzz going along, is that of all the industries that uh, are going to benefit out of uh, COVID, education is going to be one of them. And EdTech has suddenly become sort of like the golden, uh, uh, the golden child for most of these uh, funds. So, and you can see like, uh, uh, these are all, a lot of these names, I mean, like familiar names like Bloom and Sequoia and uh, Nexus. Uh, what's also interesting is that uh, Omidyar Network, the third one uh, on the list, they are what's called an impact fund. Because what is interesting is that impact fund means that they invest money but they like to see impact. Education and healthcare are the two sectors where you can show impact. It's not just, let's say, if you're providing, let's say if you like Zomato, for example, like let's say you're providing uh, restaurant delivery services, that's a good technology model, but there's not much impact you can show. Versus saying that if you're an tech company, you can say there's not just the fact that I've got a great model, I'm earning money. I've actually got a lot of impact to actually share because a lot of students have been upgraded. A lot of uh, young people have been upgraded and they can learn skills to actually get good jobs to upgrade themselves. So a lot of impact funds like Omidia Network, Michael Susan Dell Foundation are looking at uh, education companies to a great extent. So uh, again, there's a lot of potential in that space. Now let's talk about, uh, this is my final slide uh, before I get into Q&A. Let's talk a bit about what uh, venture capitalists look for. The thing is that with respect to the education uh, market. Uh, now obviously the first point is that you need an, uh, you're, you're serving an unmet need in a large and growing market. I don't think anybody can argue that the Indian education market is huge. You, we've all heard the numbers that uh, we have something like, uh, I think almost 500 million uh, people under the age of uh, 25 or 28 who will be looking at education, huge middle class. So there's definitely no question there's a huge demand in education. In fact, we are the largest market next to China for uh, requiring education. In fact, I think we'll be growing more than China because our population is growing. Unlike China, which has, because of that one child policy there, Younger, the number of young people they have is actually reducing. Their birth rate has dropped down drastically. So we actually have the largest growing market for education in the world. So there's no question there. The second point is where you may have an issue. Now, the problem is that let's say, for example, you are in a test prep. Let's say uh, you have to show you have a differentiated solution. What makes you different from the players? Now, let's say, for example, you say, hey, you know, I'm in the test prep market. I'm providing the best K-12 uh, education content for kids to learn how to pass the exams. So then the, the VC will ask you, okay, good, but there's already Vedantu, there's already Baiju, there's already Topper. All these guys are well-funded and they all have education, uh, they all have content which has been mapped to the ICSE curriculum, CBSE curriculum, right from uh, KG to uh, 12 standard. What makes your product different? Now, you can't just say, yes, I'm better than Baiju. You can't say that unless you can prove it in some way. So make sure that whatever solution you're providing, prevent, remember there are a lot of edtech players in the market a lot of them are well-funded. Make sure that whatever you're providing is validated in something. If you say you're better than Baiju's, prove it. Why? Is there a better outcome? Something you can prove. Not just because you say so. Uh, the third point is customer validation of pain and gain. Now, the thing is that, and I think we know this for most industries, is that uh, if you say that, okay, look, the customer has this problem. Let's say, for example, uh, like, like, for example, my company, we ask, ask careers, we work in the employability space, right? So for us, we know the fact that, okay, there are a lot of uh, graduates who are graduating who are not employable from colleges and a lot of companies which had a lot of open jobs, I'm talking about at least a few months ago, which were looking to hire skilled graduates, but they could not find those skilled graduates. So we defined our pain as, okay, a lot of companies have a lot of open jobs and they're looking for skilled graduates versus the pain that says, okay, the students are looking for jobs because a lot of people are helping students get jobs very few people are finding the right graduates for companies and training them. So we define what the customer uh, pain was. And again, uh, the fourth thing is now today, it's not, it's not enough to have uh, models that just burn cash left, right, and center. You have to make sure that you have a model that generates a good return on investment. You can't say, okay, look, I, my cost of producing this product is let's say a hundred rupees, but I'm selling to the customer for 50 bucks and I'm losing 50 bucks per sale. That is not a model that a lot of uh, venture capitalists are happy with anymore. The days of just burning money with unicorns has just gone, unfortunately. And of course, the last thing is that a focused team with uh, ability to execute. 
Now, this is something that a lot of you guys should think of as edtech players. I've always seen uh, edtech companies who has, have basically have seen a people who is, let's say, one guy who is, or one girl who is the entrepreneur, let's say the visionary, the marketing person, and one person who is a tech genius, the CTO, the person who's created the product. I always ask them, okay, who's the academic in your senior team? And more often than not, they don't have an academic in their senior team, which is why a lot of times when edtech companies were trying to sell to schools and colleges, because they didn't understand the customer mindset, what schools were looking for, what, what the colleges were looking for, because they had no academic in their team who actually understood their mindset, they were not able to sell very effectively. So therefore, whenever you have a, a product that you're trying to sell or trying to come up with a model, make sure that your team is very, has got the skill sets that are needed, not just in terms of technology and financial skills, but academic skills or something that is relevant to the edtech industry. All right? So I think uh, that uh, gives me a great overview of uh, the edtech space and the education space. I think at this point, we can uh, open it up to questions. Uh, Sonali? Thank you so much for such a wonderful session, Dr. Akhil. It was absolutely great. You shared some very valuable insights. And I hope it was grateful. Uh, it was helpful to everyone attending today. So yeah, we have quite a few questions already lined up with us. So I'll just read out the questions and uh, I'll make sure that no question is repeated uh, sure. again. So the first question is from Anjali. She says, how do you think that Indian K-12 system will adapt to the use of technology when the percentage of students using technology after school is only 12% according to your previous screen? Uh, American schools provide tablets to all the students in most school districts. Does Indian schools have that ability according to you? Correct. So obviously, uh, you're absolutely right. The thing is that if you ask me today, uh, do they have ability? I would say no, obviously, uh, probably 50%, especially the rural schools and the ones which are the budget schools may have a tough time providing technology. But also you need to understand is that because they're going to be forced to move towards adapting technology, they will find ways to adapt to it. So for example, like you may have either, if we're lucky, the government uh, subsidizes technology for the students. You may have NGOs who are providing uh, tablets and uh, smartphones for the kids. But also don't forget is that the cost of data has dropped down drastically. The cost of smartphones have dropped down drastically. Funnily is that if you walk into, and again, it may sound a little uh, critical, the slum area, you will actually walk into slum areas. Maybe people who don't have toilets, they have a common toilet, but they all have cable connections. So trust me, people will adapt to technology. It will happen. It may not be easy, it'll be painful, but they will adapt to technology. They'll find a way to get it. Uh, so the next question is, you talked about flipped classrooms. It's yeah. not yet a concept introduced in Indian K-12 and higher education system. Even in American universities, it's not yet widely uh, accepted and most faculty is not prepared to flip the classroom. What are your well, views on that? Well, I think my first view is that all these people who thought that faculty can't change would have to sort of eat their hats because all these faculty have started using Zoom classrooms. And I know that because, for example, we, uh, we're on the board of uh, uh, 24 colleges, which have been Bombay University uh, driven colleges, traditional education, chalk and talk lecture model, uh, been there since 1950s. Majority of faculty have adapted to Zoom and are doing online classes. So that whole excuse of saying that schools cannot adapt, faculty cannot adapt, I think through that out of window. Because the thing is that the schools, majority of schools have adapted, some better than others, but that mindset or that mental barrier that they can't adapt, I think has gone out of the window. Today, we, are, we ourselves are adapting to Zoom. I mean, how many of you were on Zoom, let's say one year ago? How many people were going on webinars one year ago? Suddenly it's all happened. So new normal, new, new habits. Great. Uh, so the next question is, uh, what's your take on home tuition platform where students can learn on live videos and in vernacular languages? Target audience are school children of standard fifth to 10, studying in tier two or tier three city, uh, cities, learning in vernacular languages. Okay, so as I said, the thing is that uh, when you're looking at home tuitions for vernacular languages, now the thing is that uh, there are a lot of ideas out there. In fact, uh, this is not the first time I've heard that idea. There are people providing home tuitions in vernacular languages. Vernacular is actually one of the big untapped spaces in India, not as competitive. So whoever's asked that question, if you're looking at asking in terms of their own business model, you probably need to make sure that you map out the market and say, okay, like the vernacular language market for uh, Swift to 12 standard kids, how huge is it? Who are the other players? And why is my product better than what's out there? Like what all VCs look for. 
But also don't forget is that unlike, let's say, uh, let's say uh, Facebook or Google where the last man standing or one, one size fits all and basically the biggest guy gets 80% of the market. Education is a very fragmented market. So even if you look at, let's say, uh, even the biggest uh, player like, let's see, uh, Baiju's, still has a small component of the market. It doesn't, have, it doesn't dominate India. So everybody will have space. If you're better at selling and you have a differentiated product, you can make money in any model. All right. So the next question is, can you please throw some light about foreign education industry? How are parents thinking now? Will they say it's abroad for higher education? Anybody into education abroad, can you please help us understand how this industry will progress? Well, the funny thing is, is that like a lot of the education industry, most of the colleges abroad are panicking, right? Because they're saying that there are two things, right? Now, so okay, let's, let's walk through this, right? If you are a Harvard and one of the top 10 colleges, you know for a fact you will get people applying. Because if you get your kid to Harvard or MIT, Kellogg, you're, you're done. I mean, like this, you're not going to say, okay, I'm not going to join Harvard because it's online for the first semester, right? So they're fine. The mid-tier guys, the guys who used to uh, depend on foreign students coming in are having a tough time. Why? Because what's happening is that, okay, if you're mid, so like a lot of kids used to go to mid-tier colleges in Australia, UK, Canada, because they knew that there was a chance of getting a job in that country and they said, we'll just take any uh, college. Most of those colleges had to subsidize the fees for their own students in the UK or Canada and used to get uh, highly uh, uh, inflated fees from the Indian students, the Chinese students that used to fund their operations, right? Now that these uh, foreign students are not coming in, these people are short of money. So what all of them are doing, they're now actually rolling out and offering courses online. So suddenly you're going to see a lot of these international universities, the mid-tier ones, trying to get students in their home countries through online education. But the problem is that for a lot of students, they say is that, okay, maybe I'll defer a year. Maybe instead of me actually paying the money for this year, let me take a break. Let me take a gap year. Let me do some internship or something like that. And then just join next year when at least I get the college experience, then I'm paying a huge amount of money. At that point, things may stabilize a bit. So yeah, temporary disruption, but finally people have to go to college. See, one thing to remember is that in school and college, people do not give up the education. You, cannot, you will not say I will give up college because the coronavirus. At some point, you'll have to do college, right? right. <laughs> Wherever you go. question is, uh, can you tell the steps to convert our college physical classrooms to online classrooms and how much time will it take according to you? I think the question is really based on the uh, mindset of the trustee or the owner of the college. The thing is that if the person wants to go slow and steady, it could take too long. If the person is uh, proactive, it could take a week. Because frankly speaking, again, we've done this in our own colleges, right? All you have to do is download a paid uh, version of Zoom. Get your, get your uh, teachers to start sending out Zoom invites to all your students. Get your teachers to start creating uh, WhatsApp groups for each class to start asking questions. Get onto Google Classroom, which is a free platform where you can send assignments and send. all the software is there and most of it is free or incredibly cheap. It's just your mindset and willingness to get your people to do it. So it's one week or one year or never. Up to you. Um, so I guess uh, we'll just take the last question now because of the shortage of time. So the last question is most learning softwares that are there are of tutoring models such as Baiju's and Vedantu. Do you know any softwares that are bringing teachers and students on the same platform? When you say bringing teachers and students on the same platform, that means that really means in terms of for what purpose, right? So if you're talking about, let's say, uh, tutoring, like, for example, if a uh, student wants to log in and get a live tutor, there are plenty of platforms. I mean, that's, I mean, any online uh, platform which has teachers teaching you through uh, synchronous or asynchronous learning is a platform. It's quite crowded. But the biggest player in India right now, the most funded guy is uh, Unacademy, which provides uh, uh, teachers, uh, providing uh, teaching videos to uh, students. But again, but again, back to the original point is that unless you have a model that's differentiated from these guys, you'll have a tough time raising money. Very interesting perspectives, Dr. Akhil. Thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for answering all the questions very patiently. Um, thank you. And uh, right. please uh, request you to attend the rest of the session as well. So, I will be there. I'll be there. Great. So I'll put off you. my video and uh, listen to the rest of the session. Thank you. Uh, everyone, if you have any questions at all, if you would, uh, you can just mail them to me and, you know, if you would like to connect, please let me know. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, a post after this, so now I'm off. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Akhil.
um, we'll just start with our next session uh, in a minute. So our next session would be more of a one-on-one -on -one interactive session. We have jotted down some of the most frequently asked questions of this time, questions that are on everyone's minds and we'll hear our experts insights on the same. So uh, we just begin one second. I would now like to introduce our second speaker. We have with us Mr. Vikram Pandya, who's the director of FinTech at SP Jain School of Global Management, where he has designed Asia's first interactive classroom-led FinTech program featuring blockchain, API, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and IoT labs. He has authored several white papers and articles on FinTech domain. He has extensive experience in banking, financial services, fintech, consultancy, and training domain. He is also associated as a mentor with various fintech startups and fintech-focused funds across the globe. He is a fintech ambassador for Maharashtra government's Uday fintech platform. With this, I hand it over to Mr. Vikram. A very uh, warm welcome to you, Mr. Vikram. Yeah, hi, Sonali. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you both. Very welcome. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, during this uh, difficult time, you know, uh, knowing what to do is very hard right now and there's no one answer. So would you like to start uh, by saying something about uh, the current scenario of education at this moment? And then we can start with the questions as well. Sure, thanks. So I will very simply uh, divide this answer into two parts. Number one is that, uh, of course, we have got more time at our hand. At the same point in time, we need to make sure that that time is utilized in a productive manner. And uh, when you look at, there are so many avenues to learn. Uh, specifically in today's digital era, we are looking at multiple different websites which are available, different tools are available. And today, even as you know, like uh, you have a games which are uh, teaching in a VR manner. Uh, to students. So Half-Life Felix is a very famous example where students are uh, taught uh, through online gaming and that is also a different way of teaching the students, right? We have different uh, avenues available and uh, students are having these avenues. It is more about knowing these avenues and utilizing these avenues in the right manner. That is one part. Second part is that sometimes what happens, people don't know what to learn and how to learn it, right? So the majority of the people have so many things to learn that they can't decide. Uh, it is like uh, you have so many choices to make that you are now not able to make any right choice. So I will suggest that you look at what you want to achieve in maybe a complementary manner in your curriculum or your career. And based on that, you decide that, okay, this is the right program for me. And also don't just look at uh, ratings. I will say that just understand there are always preview lectures available. Look at the style of teaching, understand whether it uh, fits your style of learning and then only you should go ahead with that. Right, absolutely. Um, so firstly, uh, I would like to ask you a very generic question. So according to you, how has COVID-19 impacted reg uh, regular education as we know it? We all know it's been hit severely, but uh, what are your thoughts on that? Sure, so I will divide this into uh, preschool or let's say pre-high school and then high school and then whatever graduation and etc we will discuss very quickly so physical education is uh, not possible as you know so when you are talking about face-to-face -face education that has gone for a toss but when you look at the ways and means in which people are trying to deliver it right that approach is very different when it comes to uh, normal private school or let's say schools which are having technology which was already there, even pre-COVID, the technology was there, right? For them, it is very different than uh, for schools, which are public schools and the technology was not that great for this course. It is very different. We will discuss that more in detail later. But when you look at uh, how this entire thing is uh, panning out for uh, students, parents, as well as teacher. So we need to look at uh, teachers are having some issues aligning themselves in online education because the way you deliver face-to-face uh, -face education is very different than the way you want to deliver online education. Not only it matters in the way you want to approach the student, but it also matters the way you want to divide your concepts, divide your learning outcome, and then teach student in an interactive manner. That is very different. 
and second thing is that that feedback loop which normally happens in classroom environment is not there uh, what happens is that uh, sometimes people are not sharing your screen and that video is not visible and because of that and you can't even force them right so because of that sometimes it is not uh, easy to get the reaction and that also ha has some limitation and because of that i personally believe that it is not as good as uh, physical education or face to face education but still there are ways and means you can improve so we'll also discuss that more in detail later but this is the change which we have seen pre and post covid uh so for the next question we'll be using two term uh, terminologies one would be bharat which would refer to the rural and the public sector and one would be india which would refer to the urban and private sector so how education institutes according to you across bharat versus india are dealing with this pandemic challenge and how are they adapting to it according to you a really good question i will tell you when you look at uh, the real bharat right where today you don't have that great bandwidth while 4g is there people say but the bandwidth is not yet that great in some of the remote areas second thing most of the students don't even have laptop or a mobile phone of their own right when you are looking at student this uh, high school student or pre high school student they don't have their own mobile phone or laptop and they rely on their parents to provide that device third thing is that these students are not that much tech savvy because for them as a part of their education the computer education is not covered that uh, that high because when you look at the way they teach and they learn it is very different than how the private schools are being taught right so there is a challenge which this segment faces and i will tell you today uh, even the bmc schools uh, public sector schools they have mandate that you need to provide online learning but the issue is that while teacher can somehow teach online students cannot learn online so these people are now uh, resorting to whatsapp so whatsapp is the easiest way to reach out to these students and i have seen people also doing uh, whatsapp call and whatsapp chat uh, through which they are trying to uh, teach the student given there is a limit on how many students can join a live whatsapp call these students are now also getting um online through this say namaste and some of the other platforms but again the issue becomes how to have a device dedicated device for the student this is from the student side now from the teacher side this teachers have never taught online in their most of the teachers have never taught online in their life right so for them the training becomes an issue so when you start with let's say in february late february you started with online teaching the entire one month time was spent in teaching the teacher how to do certain online task that was the number one issue second thing is that how do you make sure the parents are also on this most of the uh, teachers who are there today can't even uh, call this parents easily and the issue is that they are not approachable these parents are busy with their lives and they are not able to uh, even provide the support because they themselves are living on a daily basis right so this becomes an issue when the opportunity comes into picture and the last part is that these parents are also not tech savvy themselves so they can't help the student right so this is the bharat picture how they are uh, providing this now online education as i said through some of this online test and online uh, whatsapp medium etc but when you look at the private sector the india segment they were much more ready uh, than the public sector and today when you look at they started with some ground work and that allowed them to jump start uh, in this area and then they started with even google classroom or they had their own lmss they had also some of these uh, third party tools which are available and then they started doing this online within let's say one week or so that uh, did not take that long but for public sector it already took more than a month to get up and running so that was a challenge and Uh, somehow i personally believe that this is a blessing in disguise because people are now going to have in public sector specifically some readiness over the period of time which allows them to also offer this online education right which is also good absolutely great very well explained um the next question is so online learning market is often considered as a cheap and convenient avenue which complements traditional learning rather than the market that can substitute traditional face to face learning so how do you see this changing post the pandemic world 
and what should students consider while opting for various synchronous and asynchronous online learning options according to you right so i will tell you uh, when you look at online learning normally people just uh, look at the way content is aligned the way content is delivered right i personally believe uh, any education whether it is online or offline you should start with the consideration that what is being taught and how it is being taught so whoever is teaching right this two quality will be very critical because end of the day the way you can communicate the way you can deliver the message which you want will only happen through engagement active engagement and through the way you are able to design the entire curriculum across multiple different tasks and multiple different activities now when you look at online online normally faces uh, some challenges in this area because since there is not uh, face, there is no face to face interaction which is possible people always believe that uh, it is just that something is recorded and then uh, uh, asynchronous learning for example something is recorded and then something is being taught uh, maybe for couple of hours and then it is done that is one way of teaching and you have remis of the world you have courseras of the world doing something similar to this where the content is recorded and it is delivered right now it is not uh, not bad as such but the idea behind what you want to learn versus what is being delivered there can be a mismatch because there is no interactive uh, session which is going on and because of that you are not able to ask the question clarify the doubts etc and because of that today we are looking at a shift from that traditional learning online learning to new age online learning which we normally call as a premium learning experience online so when we look at premium learning experience online we want to make sure that whatever is theory theory is given to students beforehand so that it is a flipped class concept theory is always given to student beforehand and during the classroom session only the discussion activities are going to happen and all this uh, online learning session becomes more interactive because of that given that online learning most of the people are going to get distracted because they are at home so it is very difficult to keep them engaged for more than 2 hours a day or even 3 hours a day right so the way you want to structure this online learning uh, defines the way you want to also make sure the student is engaged so in this case normally interactive activities group discussion you have breakout rooms online also possible uh, so all these activities when you do and when you make it engaging interactive then only it will make more sense for everyone right absolutely um so the next question is what uh, according to you are the options available for students who are planned for international education and they are currently stranded yeah okay i will tell you that uh, online education sometimes uh, when you look at specifically for international uh, whatever they had thought right wherever they had decided to go most of the places they are also offering online education now so in case you are interested and you are comfortable with online education you can continue and start with that online education however in some of the scenarios you may not want to continue and you may want to still go there physically and you want to participate in that university in a physical manner for that you may need to wait till one year and during that one year period i would strongly recommend this students to get upskilled in certain areas number one today in any area you go whether it is business or science or technology certain technologies are, are creating a fabric on which entire businesses are created for example apis you have blockchain ai ml big data ar vr iot all these technologies are everywhere wherever you look at right so you need to understand this technologies in more detail and once you understand it is not like you need to do programming but you need to understand the techno strategy considerations behind this technologies and once you know about them then it becomes much more easier for you to go ahead in future understand the business strategies around it and then create certain good business models right uh, the next question is so edtech industry was already booming uh but do you think due to this pandemic uh it has provided a further boost to the sector absolutely so i will tell you that you have seen multiple uh, acquisitions also happening during this time there are multiple vc rounds also happening in edtech so edtech was always about uh, making sure that you are able to achieve scale while also providing something innovative and uh, something with quality that was always uh, has been the uh, aim from the edtech companies 
when you look at today's ad tech companies you can divide them into content companies versus uh, platform companies so content company normally have content with them and they uh, they just provide that content as a service and then you have a platform companies or marketplace companies which are allowing others to come and then deliver sessions or uh, provide some content and then share with the community so when you look at this content companies uh, this companies were uh, doing something and now suddenly the content demand is much higher right so for them the valuation has gone up because of the higher demand however for the platform company it has become even more profitable because even all these people who are sitting at home teachers who can't teach uh, physically all these people are coming to this platform companies and starting their teaching uh, career online for the first time and this new to business or new to segment uh, customers are helping this edtech uh, sector very much if you look at the valuation increase in platform companies it has been more than uh, 50 to 60% valuation increase however on the content side it has been around 30 to 40% so this has been the trend and when we look at uh, the current scenario uh, likes of jio or airtel they are also partnering with these companies to provide certain educational content to their customers so it is always a b2b approach also which is working good so b2b2c approach is right now getting more traction okay. uh, so what are the salient features uh, of edtechs which are attracting the current generation according to you uh, right so uh, earlier what used to happen edtech only used to mean that you are taking some online session or you are just dumping certain ppts or dumping certain references for students to read under today's edtech you are more worried about the interaction and the feedback that is very critical interaction with the student the experience of the student overall which includes the feedback and for the company which is taking this right and for example for the teachers also and for parents for them analytics is very critical analyzing how the student is faring where he is lacking and where should i focus more right so all these things are today uh possible using big data analytics using certain interactive tools so i'll give you one simple example so when you look at uh, mathematics right mathematics can become very boring and there are people who are trying to teach this in a interactive manner through games through uh, drag and drop interfaces through vr uh, so there they are also providing some applications which you can use to uh, experience that in ar augmented reality so you can understand okay this is a cube i can understand this is a cube face in my uh, room itself right and i can play with that so all those things are becoming more and more mainstream and because of that you are able to now play with these figures science also right science used to be very difficult for difficult for most of the people to understand and when you look at today most of this chemical reaction which happens right you can do all those things in the virtual lab and this provides that practical experience to the student and experiential learning is provided through all these new platforms so the edtech of the future will be also very different than what we are looking at today edtech of the future will more rely on micro learning today when we are looking at uh, learning it becomes group learning but then what happens after that that student let's say after uh, one hour of online learning you realize that one student is uh, having only 10% learning and uh, there are five students who are with 50% learning and then you have a different learning level across multiple people the moment you look at micro learning once the lecture is over once the group lecture is over this micro learning can take over and the students who are not doing good can be given assignments specifically uh, for them and you can also do a matchmaking where students who are good can also help them out because peer learning helps a lot because students are not going to learn that well from teacher who they can't connect with but when you are talking about students with their own ages then they are going to interact much easily question uh, is very important and uh, something that hasn't been covered here yet so what strategic considerations do you think are critical for investors who would like to invest or banks or ndfcs who would like to provide lending to the education sector entities a uh, great question i will say that look today as we know most of the banks even if you look at the numbers almost 8.9 trillion rupees are now parked with rbi uh they are not uh, looking forward to lending uh, to any most of the sectors you will see they are not looking for lending right so when you look at uh, education sector you can see that uh, mainly into education sector 
earlier education loans were given and uh, when you look at the current scenario people are not sure whether there is a uh, visibility for employment in future or there is a visibility when you look at whether it is going to have a good uh, roi for that loan right so that's what people look at so i will divide this into two part one is the face to face education or traditional education i will say and traditional education people are not yet sure whether to go ahead or not they want to wait and watch before they start lending so banks and bfcs they are still waiting for that uh, clarity before they start lending to this uh, sector now let's look at the online learning sector right what happens here is that uh, when you look at online learning earlier also uh, likes likes of uh, coursera and udemy they had partnered with some of the online education institutions where online education institutes had partnered with banks or financial institutions and they were providing micro lending to all the students once they finished the program uh, they were able to get the loan and uh, then it was like 50 50 or 70 30 loan sharing which they were they used to do uh, in this segment i see uh, that there is a promise and today also online uh, fintechs which are there right fintech sector specifically they are very versatile they are very flex flexible enough to go ahead and offer certain services in this area and when you look at uh, them they are already starting on this area and they have started providing services uh, with uh, small micro loans like you have 5000 rupee program so sometimes people may not be able to even pay that much so they are paying let's say 3000 rupee out of 5000 or when there is a 10000 rupee program then they are providing let's say 8000 out of 10000 something like that so this is already happening as we speak now from the investor perspective or venture capital perspective whether you should invest in uh, edtech or not right so there are edtechs which are like me too they just wanted to start because there is a craze going on and they want to encash on that right you need to look at three fundamental sectors uh, before you start investing into anything so in this sector when you divide that this sector into sub domains the first sub domain uh, as i already mentioned is more mostly on the content marketplace side in content marketplace you need to first check the quality of content and relevance uh, of that content in the current scenario right content gets uh, obsolete very quickly given the dynamic nature of today's uh, education it is very difficult to have a content which which is let's say relevant even after 5 years or let's say 3 years right earlier it used to be okay but today it is not uh, not such right so you need to make sure that uh, the content is relevant and easily updatable that's number one so when you invest in that content company look at the quality and dynamic nature of the content second thing is that uh, when you look at uh, the revenue model right sometimes it is just that they want to grow people and most of the company today when you look at uh, in covid environment they are offering free services which is not wrong but you should have a concrete business model behind it how are you going to convert this customer into a paying customer later on in any model it can be any model it can be bulk model group model doesn't matter but you need to have a model and it is not like that 100% of the new customers are going to be a paying customer for you but what you need to do at least is that you need to make sure that 10% 5% 3% also also is okay but you need to convert them in future in a paying customer basis and then when you look at the second segment which is a platform content or platform plus content play right when you look at this segment most of the people uh, are going online teaching uh, to their students and there is a commission which is uh, getting subtracted from this entire thing and uh, uh, given to the uh, ultimate uh, platform company so when you look at this model this model is for pay, a pure play commission model right and uh, the model will only work when you are able to scale up very quickly so you, you need to look at as a vc company you need to look at the scalability part you need to look at how robust this platform is in in a way you can scale it and uh, what are the features available so that uh, even the teachers can track and trace certain things and even students are engaged enough otherwise online education people always say that there is a drop out rate of 80 90% right which is very high than the traditional segment so all these things you need to manage the platforms which are able to manage this successfully are getting higher valuation and the last segment which is very new segment in education is that people are providing certain uh, mentorship right the way we are today providing the, this common session there are paid one on one mentors and this mentorship platforms are uh, upcoming and uh, in this scenario when you are investing you need to look at the quality of the network which these guys are able to bring on the platform right and uh, there has to be a proper revenue uh, model besides whatever you are talking about quality quantity is one thing but revenue model also for this one is very critical
So this three you need to look at. Great, wonderful. So uh, the next question is, uh, can you please provide some light on the collaboration happening across various edtech and fintech firms and this pandemic? Sure. Uh, I will give you a couple of examples. Uh, so number one, as I said in, in the scenario uh, today, uh, this micro lending, which we, are, uh, we, are, we were talking about, right? So that micro lending space, there are companies, uh, one is Credit Vidya, there was one company that, that Credit Vidya is also uh, now talking about identifying the credit risk, uh, how, how to identify credit risk, and then they are tying up with NBFC for providing loan, right? So they are, this is one example. Then there is another company, uh, which also looks into the same area. They also provide lending uh, through partnerships because some of these this fintechs can't take lending on their own books. So they are partnering with NBFCs and banks to provide this micro lending. But the way they are looking at this credit quality is very interesting because earlier what used to happen is that people just used, used to look at the earning capacity or let's say the uh, way you can provide some proof, right? Whether you have a bank balance or whether you have a constant revenue stream. So when you look at micro lending, People don't worry that much on your continuous revenue stream. They, they are looking at your credit score, uh, traditional credit score, plus your other uh, uh, credit score, which is alternative credit score. And there are multiple ways and means you can achieve that. So people are already using that to identify the score. Plus, most of the people are looking at uh, how you can encase this in future. How can you make sure that uh, this can really upskill or upscale this entire uh, learning experience for that student and whether the career uh, enhancement is possible. That is another thing people look at. So this is one example. Second example is in case of uh, fintechs, they are trying to identify how to give uh, loans to trainers, how to give loans to trainers so that they can start uh, earning using the online platforms or setting up the online business. This is the new thing which has happened only during the uh, pandemic. So this is a micro loan, short term loan given against revenue. So what they are saying, okay, you want to set up your online uh, classroom, we will give you certain uh, rupees. And then once you start your classroom, based on your earning, you are supposed to give us 10% of the earning, 20% of the earning. And that's how they are structuring this deal. And it is uh, normally a short term loan. So interest rate is uh, normally lower than the traditional uh, models, but it is not, uh, not uh, lower than the personal loan. That is also an issue. Uh, this could be the last question from my end and after that we can take some questions from the audience as well. Uh, so the last question is, how should government machinery and NGOs provide support to educational institutes to fight and survive this pandemic according to you? A very good question. I will, I will tell you that uh, today as you speak, government is already helping in some of the areas. Uh, government uh, through Ministry of Health and Family Welfare uh, uh, section are uh, issuing certain advisories and certain ways through which you can provide certain education. And then you have also government, government machinery on the education side, uh, which also is providing you certain tools. Uh, so those tools are available uh, free of cost online. You can look at the websites I will share with you all. And uh, those tools are used by even public schools today. Uh, which is much more easier to uh, provide uh, and let's say online education is much more achievable, right? So that, that is what they are focusing on. However, where they are lacking today, uh, this, there are three areas where government is lacking. Number one, today train the trainer is not sufficient uh, for teachers who are, let's say, not that much tech savvy and uh, over 40 years, for example, mm -hmm. they need to provide more focused training to teachers who are above 40 years of age. They are not that uh, tech savvy and it will not be much easier for them to know these new technologies, right? So they need to have a, a greater handholding required. And uh, because of that, uh, they are facing challenges. So that is number one. Second thing is that parents. So there has to be uh, campaigns running on uh, TV or uh, radios, whatever is possible to tell them that, okay, during also this pandemic, online education is possible and you need to still support your child for online education. There is no campaign which is happening through monkey bath or whether anything else you also look at, right? This campaign should be there because parents will only understand the importance of uh, education, whether it is uh, a post lockdown or pre lockdown, doesn't matter. You need to still have this 
a requirement that students are able to do online uh, sessions with help of their parents because these students uh, proper bharat students are not able to learn online otherwise third thing is more about uh, the bmc school or public school machinery itself where uh, normally what happens right these are the centers through which government distributes even the uh, essentials so when you look at essential distribution through this public schools or through this uh, machinery which we are talking about at that point in time also you can distribute certain uh, hand uh, let's say hard copy material and then this hard copy materials can be used by student uh, for pre learning that is right now not happening so those things i think i believe is required on ngo side they are already doing uh, much more than what uh, they normally do so teach for india for example is one ngo which is right now helping out this uh, bmc school teachers and uh, there are a couple of more uh, ngos which are really helping out in some of the new technologies for example uh, setting up uh, uh, zoom calls for teachers right they they do it for them and then they help them out uh, teaching uh, through certain different interactive modes like you have wolfram mathematica or wolfram alpha all those things are not uh, well known even in private schools right so these ngos are helping both private and public schools in exploring this interactive new online materials and then based on that they are teaching perfect uh, thank you so much for answering all our questions uh, mr vikram you were very patient in answering all of them and uh, we actually have some very interesting questions from some of our audiences as well so if you don't mind we can just uh, carry on with some of their questions as well sure why not perfect um so the first question uh, comes from uh, mr kartik sharma he says what kind of iot cloud based technology you think is best suitable in the current and post covid era and what's the potential of business automation products how can education institution make the best use of cloud based iot based automation products to enhance interaction and engage students good question i will uh, divide this into two part because one is the uh, cloud computing related and second is iot Uh, so i will start with uh, cloud first because it is uh, normally used by everyone without with or without knowing right so cloud computing or cloud based uh, teaching or cloud based hosting whatever you say uh, is nothing but just making sure that you are uh, you are using uh, internet based or uh, you are using third party based server farms and this server farms are uh, then not your headache right so you are focusing on what you are required to do and you are allowing professionals to manage what they are best at so that is that is number one so in in this pandemic era when whether you are a, a small online tutor or whether you are a big school or university all of you should consider outsourcing your hosting to cloud providers and there are also companies which help you out in migration so why not right they can help you out with the migration from physical environment if you are having to the digital cloud environment so that is number one uh, second thing is that uh, when you look at iot iot is internet of things as we know and uh, it really means that you are converting any physical uh, parameters to digital parameter that is number one so when i say physical to digital for example temperature humidity all these are physical parameters using iot devices you are able to convert them into digital parameters so that you can then analyze them you can uh, predict certain things and you can do certain actions based on that right so uh, with iot you can do multiple things during this covid era uh, for example uh, your phone is also iot device for example because you have so many uh, sensors within that that uh, that phone can also be considered as iot device when you look at phone uh, arv setu as we know already uses uh, bluetooth and it uses certain uh, different parameters like gps and uh, encryption to share data when two people are are uh, meeting each other or they are passing through so what happens using that is that automatically uh, the sensor identifies that there is a nearby device and uh, if that person uh, is identified as covid positive then uh, your mobile will also understand without sharing the data directly to the government it will understand that you have been in contact with someone who is having covid uh, 19 once you look at this uh, uh, analysis then the contact tracing becomes very easy and you are able to provide uh, medical assistance to entire contact uh, chain 
that is number one second thing is that in education uh, normally what happens is that uh, look iot devices uh, are very very cheap also and when you look at uh, phones they are very 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 costly but when you just look at certain things which are available within the phone like accelerometer or gyroscope that they, they allow you to do certain things in interactive manner like you have a ar vr so you can just use ar vr so iot is already being used in ar vr without you knowing so that is number 2 i assume that that answers your question and just following up on that question he also says can we use technology like knx zigbee and z wave in educational institutions will education institutes accept these automation platforms so i know uh, a couple of them so i will discuss more on that uh, so i will tell you look educational institutions are uh, normally open to new innovation provided uh, there is a proper uh, justification in order to provide this tool normally what happens if you are creating any business model where student needs to pay and there is a tangible benefit for the student then uh, schools will automatically accept that they will not worry about it but if you say that school will need to provide this as a part of the program you need to provide proper justification and cost saving that is the general answer to all the uh, different uh, software you can think about right whether it is automation whether it is let's say new e learning mod module or whether it is some 3d uh, learning whatever you talk about any business model should be able to provide some cost advantage to the uh, school or better experience where uh, parents are ready to pay because automation better out of it question comes from mr abhishek jain he says how can we compensate students for physical experience of college so that we should not reduce the fee structure which was taken for that experience and not alone for teaching them a good question so i partially covered this uh, when i uh, spoke about premium learning online experience so when you look at uh, make sure that students are engaged throughout the session uh so let's say if this is an interactive session i will make sure that after and before every topic of course you need to divide your session in multiple sub topics right it cannot be a lengthy discussion otherwise everybody will just doze off so you need to make sure that uh, you are able to divide your uh, learning outcomes or uh, teaching material in such a manner that you can divide that into bite sized uh, portions and then once you are teaching it you need to always keep them engaged so one way of keep, keeping them engaged is that you do some polling or do some do some activity with them and second method is that while you are doing something uh, you also make sure that they are doing it right and uh, always provide theory whatever they can read beforehand you can provide them uh, earlier and then they can once they come you can just do re revision rather than covering everything again you just do revision and then you do activity based uh, training that is what we call so Uh, when i look at uh, the way i teach or where i i provide the sessions uh, after this covid 19 pandemic number one is that uh, you start with your session the entire session you which you want to teach and try to make sure that that session learning outcome is properly defined then you divide that learning outcome into three areas things to read things to watch and things to do provide this three part prior to they come to the session and once they go through these things they will get some basic idea and it is there is always pre read and post read so once the topic is covered this things to read things to watch and things to do will be there for prior to the session and after the session during the session you will only discuss and debate with them you will make sure that you provide some case studies you provide some uh, real life examples and let them discuss and decide on the outcome that way they will be more uh, engaged in whatever you are doing and uh, two hours will be gone like this right so this helps a lot there is a proper way of doing this that's what i believe um so the next question comes from susmita pande she says so how to teach e learning to the students in this pandemic situation where students used to go to computer center uh, centers for learning basics of computers so to become tech savvy also in in bharat students need to go for computer co uh, courses which is now stopped excellent question uh, i will tell you that you can use certain tools like uh, team viewer or any days for example and then you can also control students uh, pc right 
there are uh, tools like GoToMeeting where even in group calls you can control students PC. These are the tools which are better suited for this. So what happens is that let's say you are uh, doing classroom online classroom. Number one thing what you want to do is that you don't want to have more than 10 students in this classroom when it is something where you are doing something on their uh, on their behalf. Right? So you should not have more than 10 at a time. Otherwise it becomes chaos. So you go you try to teach them a concept and you do it on their PC uh, help them out in doing so and that way they will learn it much faster. That is number one. Second thing is that basics of computer education. For example, you can always share certain videos and material which they can watch and learn very basics and fundamental of computer. You can always share uh, links uh, to the videos, right? And that is manageable. But beyond that, something which is difficult to teach, you need to go ahead and help them out uh, one on one or maybe in a small group. That's the answer. So the next question is very short. It just says, uh, what do you think will be the substitute for subjective tests? Uh, I mean, exams for students. Uh, sorry, can you repeat it? I, uh, uh, I could not get the last part. Sure. Uh, so uh, the question is, what according to you will be the substitute for subjective exams uh, in this scenario? Uh, it depends on which uh, uh, level of uh, education you are providing. Let's say you are providing uh, it to primary school or uh, pre-primary school. There you don't need to provide uh, something which is very complex, right? complicated. You can always take online Viva or you can just take certain things, activity-based learning you can provide. That is possible. But for higher education, postgraduates and graduate, you need to provide something which is case study driven. Uh, research driven because specifically during this pandemic since they have time you can provide them research based learning outcomes and uh, when you teach something and you give them the project and when they do some research they learn even more they will come up with uh, their own questions right they will be more curious because the moment you uh, make child a, a curious child he will learn on his own suddenly you are teaching him something well beyond the traditional learning right while learning something online, he may identify 10 different new topics and he may come back to you asking new questions, right? This is the way you should teach them. Right. Um, so the next question comes from Mr. Abhishek Jain. He says, what do you think will happen to colleges which are not in professional courses like offering BCom and other similar courses? Also, will the customer choose more to go to college with more fees now? Or will they choose the colleges with lesser fees uh, options since they'll not be going to colleges physically? Okay, so when you look at uh, education which is delivered online, normally the traditional mindset which our corporate world has is that online education is not uh, similar to face to face education and it is given lower weightage, right? Uh, however, I personally believe post this pandemic. Uh, given that even the likes of Harvard and Wharton uh, and others are providing online education, mm -hmm. uh, it will make uh, people to change their mindset. These corporates will also uh, now accept this as a learning, uh, learning which is valid learning. And uh, this will help people to provide education on a higher scale, greater scale, as well as reduce the fee. Because once the scale is high, you can reduce the fee, right? Even for the quality topmost institutions, I'm talking that this will happen. So uh, for you, I personally believe going forward in the long run, even after let's say two or three years, you will see more and more uh, institutes providing quality online courses and uh, people will also start accepting them. So for you, if you are really thinking about going online or physical, you should think uh, for the quality of the education which you are going to get through the uh, quality of the institutes. So think on that first. If you are convinced on that, then it doesn't matter whether it is online or face to face. Okay. Um, so the next question is what online courses should educators do or what uh, courses can they do to upskill themselves according to you? Okay. So if you are, uh, if you are uh, again teaching, let's say uh, from fifth standard to uh, eighth standard, then uh, the main courses you want to do is that, look, it is always your topic which you are teaching, right? So you need to make sure that uh, I'm able to give certain real life examples. And for giving that real life example, look at some of the YouTube channels. You will uh, be uh, 
amazed by the quality at which they provide this sessions right so there is a channel called three uh, three blue uh, one brown or something like that uh, so that channel for example provides you amazing education and uh, once you learn through that you look at the same concept like pythagorean uh, uh, theorem pythagorean theorem you just look at the same simple concept and then you are able to apply it to multiple scenarios right from the basics to very advanced right and then you can decide you can choose which concept you want to deliver to your audience so audience uh, except uh, let's say your audience participation is going to be very critical and their experience is going to be very critical and because of that you need to learn how to do effective communication that's number one effective communication is something which you should learn and second is that how to teach digitally that's the number two part because i'm sure you are good at whatever you are doing there is no uh, no way i can tell you that you should learn that again what you should learn is how to deliver what you already know and how to best make use of uh, online medium great um, so we'll just take the last two questions now uh, because uh, we are reaching the end of time um so the second last question is what according to you will be the scenario for early child education preschool sector what should one do and what future do you see for preschool franchising as well okay preschool is typically uh, more difficult because at that age you want to make sure that uh, students are playing with each other there is a social element which you want to cultivate uh, and uh, uh, normally during this pandemic this uh, that generation is very difficult to manage also right you know that so uh, i personally believe uh, even post pandemic there is a merit uh, in uh, having this online and face to face uh, element mixed together to provide more effective learning for this preschool people and uh, this uh, preschool franchises which are there in the market uh, the franchisee which will evolve uh, fast enough uh, to make sure that there is a proper well balanced combination will survive and thrive uh just uh, take the last question uh, the last question is what's your view on live webinar learning versus recorded uh, recorded videos learning from a customer's perspective sure so uh, those two are very different marketplaces so when you are talking about the live versus recorded recorded uh, sessions are considered as a asynchronous method and uh, live is basically synchronous learning methods when you look at uh, live versus recorded number one you need to remember is that uh, recorded sessions are professionally done right there is of course uh, a chance to cut it and then you need to uh, make sure that there is a proper step by step learning which is uh, provided without thinking about the type of audience you are looking at because for you there is no audience management which you can do at the time of recording so that uh, that is very different then the live interactive session which we call as a synchronous learning method so when you say webinar based of course then yeah, that synchronous can be divided into webinar and uh, meeting kind of a thing which we are looking at right now where let's say right now this is a webinar but meeting where uh, where you can also interact with the faculty is very different in webinar what you need to do is that uh, you need to make sure that the content is very very high, uh, very much curated and it is highly uh, driven based on ppt because then you are able to cover certain points Uh, which are required to be covered in the webinar but when it is live interactive session uh, what i discussed earlier uh, that you can do because in that scenario you can give them pre read uh, or post read and during the session you can always have interactive discussion right so i personally believe that uh, webinar is not the right model to teach student webinar is a model which can be uh, easily uh, scaled beyond let's say 500 students also right doesn't matter so there are uh, instances where webinar is better because you can't provide education at a scale to 500 people uh, otherwise it is very difficult right so that is one thing but at the same point in time when you want to provide effective education uh, premium education you need to think about not more than 30 student you can't handle 30 stu students in a uh, let's say face to face education also so when you are looking at this kind of a uh, online education you need to limit your number of students to 30 to 40 maximum uh, that's it from my side yeah i think one question quickly i will answer uh, one question is that uh, uh, whether installing local server with learning material would work better for uh, schools in uh, rural area right so when you look at this segment my personal opinion is that the challenge is not only network connectivity challenge is also uh, how to distribute it later right today no, nobody can come in school so even if you have local server 
how are you going to make sure that the student can come to the school right that is the more difficult part and the most difficult part in this entire thing so what you want to do here is that uh, because you need to maintain social distancing the only way it is possible is that you partner with this telecom provider and make sure that uh, you are able to optimize the content uh, good enough so that that at least the text and basic image based content can be provided to them if not the video based content so you need to partner with this telecom provider and make this free make this part free and the once you make it free most of these people can afford it so let's say jio for example they can uh, reach to all this uh, millions of people airtel for example they can reach out to this millions of people so when you are able to reach out to this people along with this free medium uh, i am sure that uh, these people can get advantage of this much easily thanks i think this covers all the questions right absolutely thank you so much mr vikram thank you for your wonderful insights and advice for everyone present uh, here i'm sure uh, we were able to add value to everyone's uh, lives through uh, through your session thank you so much for being so patient and Yeah, I guess we'll just wrap up the session now. Once again, thank you to both our speakers, Mr. Vikram and Dr. Akhil. Uh, thank you for being a part of this webinar. Uh, and yeah, that's it. Uh, would Happy you like? There. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Rani. Thanks, thank you, Dr. Akhil. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Vikram. Bye. -bye. So thank you to all our attendees. We'll see you next time with another webinar. So our next webinar is actually on twelfth of May. and it's about business valuation for uh, startups and young growth companies so if you need any information regarding that uh, please get in touch with me through an email and i would be happy to provide you with more information uh, until next time thank you so much stay home and stay safe thank you